It really just isn't about control and land and power. It's not just about that. There's, there's more, there, there's like fisheries, forestry, subsurface, um, governance, fiscal. There's a whole pile of water. So any, any of those chapters can give you a wealth of information on projects that we're doing today. And vice versa, some of the projects that we're doing today actually affect our thinking on treaty topics. So it's, it's kind of a, it treaty immerses itself in everything that we do, and yet a lot of our projects actually get funneled to treaty for more clarifications. One of the key pieces of work done by the team has been the land identification. This has resulted in a comprehensive detailed document outlining the traditional occupation and use of the Heisler territory and all its resources. We have a very big area, and every last area is marked by uh, and owned by certain people with their hereditary names. We, as the highest law, we have to think about our people, the land, and the resources, and whether or not we are going to get a fair, our own fair share and our own say in how the resources will be managed? Well, the, 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 the fundamental principles that we use in our negotiations are based on our traditional lands. And our lands are made up of 54 Wawes. And underneath the umbrella of Wawes, we have Bagwiyas. Wawes means mountain. And so it's from mountaintop to mountaintop, and, and each Wawes has a steward that has a name and a title that is associated with that stewardship area. And there are responsibilities that go along with it. And we have a, a traditional law, what I call Heisla common law, and that's what we call Nuyam. And what we do with our model is those are the, 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 the fundamental principles. And if you look at our traditional model of trade and commerce, our lands and resources provided our people with food, shelter, clothing, sustenance, and wealth. And our people traded up and down the coast. And it, it was the trade from family to family and then from nation to nation that generated the wealth. That wealth came from our lands and resources. And the Heisla have a remarkable history, uh, whether it's in their elders or in the uh, younger people in the society, in the Heisla nation, have a, there's a deep understanding of a property holding system that when you look at it, it seems alien from a Canadian legal perspective, and you look at it further, you can see the common threads. In the Canadian legal system, if you want to show title, to your house, to your farm, you say, here's my deed of title. It's registered in the land title system. And the Heisla system, a Heisla uh, name attaches to a property, uh, to an area, a Wawais, which would be the, the, the mountain, the whole valley stretching down to the water. And that title is reaffirmed uh, in the feast hall. And it's a witness gathering with uh, Heisla members there. And if there are any errors that are made in discussing who owns what and who has what privileges, those errors can be corrected on the spot. So really the Heisla Feast Hall is the functional equivalent to the British Columbia Land Titles Office. And the evidence of Heisla title to each of those 54 Huawei's within Heisla territory is still out there and it's still reasonably intact. So a lot of the Heisla work has been gathering the evidence through the uh, interviews of Heisla people, of the uh, Wawais, what they were used for, how they were attached to particular names, and how those names were attached to particular Heisla clans. And you, what develops is a, essentially a Heisla encyclopedia of ownership of the entire territory, a Heisla land title system. The Heisla traditional territory that that uh, the council has uh, put forward before membership and it's it's uh, it's called the highest called the national territory Bagoyas. it's our 
it's our land we live and harvest as we you know the the needs of our of our people and it's it's very it's a document that's put together by people that are no longer with us and some of them are still alive and it's a very important document and you go through it and and it's a tool that we use to to uh, have our some of our registered trap line that wasn't registered and we have succeeded on that. At least six years of dedicated work went into documenting everything from major events, unique features of the land, to the family stewardships throughout the territory. We're coming up to a place that are called Eikachilanu, by Phanaxa term, and it's a big flat rock, significant to our people due to the fact that they know that this rock seems to be just balancing on a small little piece. And it's in an angle that you're going to see that they couldn't believe it. It's been there for, I don't know, thousands of years, I guess, and you'll be able to see it here. They call it Ikakilanu. That's the, in Gardner Canal, too. There's two falls here that you've just seen uh, video. Uh, we call it Chichakuti. It means an area where two, two uh, rivers or creeks meet. And uh, what, why they call it this one when it's uh, its biggest in the fall? It creates a mist that the mist meets in the middle of the channel. So that's what that means, Chichakuti. We're right now. We're at the Kauis uh, Inlet here. This is uh, the area that I inherited from my late uncle. And it comes with a chief name, Chiquita, uh, and I chief of the Eagle Clan. And this I inherited by being picked as the second one in line for this name. But the first one that uh, was in line, he. He didn't quite get to it, and he died of a heart attack, so that naturally put me in line for this uh, name. And this is the area that uh, this name owns. It's called Kawisas, Chief Matthews Bay. Ooh, there it goes. For any nation to have a healthy language, culture, and way of life, requires a solid and healthy land base, something the Heisla have always had and will continue to fight for. So really for me, whether I'm a councillor or not, my wish for me is that we start, we continue to gain control over the land, whether that be through treaty or case law or just outright buying the land on our own coin. Uh, but I think that's where I'd like to go. Outside of treaty, that's where I'd like to go buying land as private fee simple land, convert it to reserve, and then have the protection of Aboriginal rights and title surround that fee simple land. So I have now, I got now got a protection on the land itself through ownership, as well as rights and title to surrounding lands. And at the same time, if I could, try to put a commercial interest on the land as well, so now I have all three covered. Through the process, we're able to, to get the land that we want to develop and be self-sufficient on, on uh, bringing revenue into your community where you'll be able to, to deal with health and education and, you know, and, uh, and others. So we don't have to be dependent on the government. That's where we want to go. And that's where treaty fits into our plan for the future. This brings us to another key component of the Heisler Treaty Team's plans, economic development.